Hi, I'm Kristen Averett. I'm a researcher here at the University of Colorado Boulder with the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. And I'm standing here at the University of Colorado Boulder power plant. Today, what we're going to be talking about is the energy water nexus. The thing about energy and water is that they're intrinsically linked. Water requires energy, and energy requires water. First, let's start with the, um, with the amount of water that's required for energy. Every part of the energy spectrum requires water. It's required for extraction of our resources. It's required for refining. It's also required for the generation of power at power plants like the one that I'm standing next to. It's also required further on in the process, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to actually focus on the amount of water that's required to generate electricity because over 80% of all the water used by the energy sector is used for thermoelectric power generation. So what is thermoelectric power generation? At many power plants, in fact, 90% of the plants across the United States, the power, it doesn't just require coal or natural gas, it actually requires water. The way these power plants work is that they have a reservoir of water in this power plant. You burn a fuel, say coal or natural gas, or through, through nuclear processes, and that actually heats up that reservoir of water, generates steam, and that steam turns a turbine. That turbine generates electricity. But the important part of this process is that that steam has to be recondensed. The best and most efficient way to do this is to bring cold water into that power plant. This cold water, or cooling water, is why generation of electricity requires so much water. You must have a continuous supply of cold water. Now, there are two major ways in which you can cool a power plant and you can provide cooling water. One process uses evaporative cooling. What that is, you have water coming through the power plant, you recondense the water, and that water is cooled through evaporation, through a cooling tower, or maybe it sits in a pond and you have water that evaporates into the air. The other way is that you have a power plant that has a continuous supply of cold water. Say that it sits on a river, it sits on a stream, or, or on a gigantic reservoir. The water continuously comes through that power plant. But there are trade-offs with these two processes. In an evaporatively cooled plant, what you're going to have is you're going to consume more water than you do relative to a once-through plant. Consumptive meaning that you're going to evaporate more water, have more evaporative loss. At the other type of power plant, a once-through facility, you're actually going to be withdrawing more water than you would at an evaporative plant. So there are trade-offs withdrawals versus consumptive use, and the choice of what type of cooling technology is actually used at those individual power plants. The other thing to consider is that at a once-through plant, the temperature of the water that comes into the plant, when it's spit back out into that reservoir stream or lake, on average, it's 17 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. There are power plants where the effluent temperatures exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and in some cases, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You might be okay with that if you're a bass, but if you're a trout, you might not be too thrilled about it. So there have been challenges with this around the country, particularly in the East Coast, where we have a lot of once-through plants. The second thing that's really important in terms of determining how much water is used at a power plant is actually the fuel that's burned. So say you have a coal-fired power plant down the street from your house. I do, it's just called the Valmont Generating Station. It's a couple miles away. Say that power plant's gonna be decommissioned. If I'm going to decommission that power plant, you know, I, I run a major utility, and I want to replace it with, say, nuclear power or even concentrated solar power, but using the same cooling technology, believe it or not, I would actually use just as much, if not more, water per unit of electricity than I would, com or compared with the, co the coal-fired power plant. So the important point here is nuclear, concentrated solar, they're low-carbon technologies but they are not low water technologies. Again, trade-offs. So say I go back to the drawing board and I'm thinking, hey, you know, I really want something that's low carbon and low water. Well, what about natural gas? If I was to replace my coal-fired power plant with natural gas, I could reduce the carbon emissions by about 50% as well as the water use. And when I'm saying water use, I'm talking about both consumption and withdrawal. So that seems like a win-win situation, but could I even reduce both even further? Well, there are options such as PV, which is similar to what you have on your house. They actually develop that at utility scales, not just in the United States, but across the world. Or you could invest in wind technologies. 
low carbon, low water, win-win. That said, there's not necessarily a silver bullet when it comes to future of electricity generation. We need power. It's really what sustains us. It's what's really helps support our economy. But we really need to think about the multiple trade-offs. For example, when we think about PV and we think about wind technologies, there are large land use footprints. There is not necessarily the perfect solution. We just have to think about the broad scope of options that we have available. Now, one reason that the energy water nexus, and particularly the water that we require for thermoelectric generation, has become so important in recent years is because of so-called collisions. These are times at which electricity generation at power plants has had to be either curtailed or completely shut off. And this has happened for one of three reasons. The first, if your incoming temperature, the temperature of the water coming in your power plant is too warm, the efficiency of the, of the power plant absolutely tanks. As a consequence, it's not efficient to generate electricity. You have to have that cold water. And in the case of a nuclear power plant, it's flat out dangerous to be bringing hot water into the plant. The second is if your effluent temperatures are too high. I mentioned those 90, 90 degree and 100, 100 degree effluent temperatures. In some states across the United States, there are regulations where temperatures cannot exceed certain thresholds as in order to uh, protect aquatic ecosystems. And then the third reason is that there's just flat out not enough water. You have to have that water available in order to make it run. So during times of drought, we've actually seen power plants that have had to shut down because they just flat out don't have enough water. So most of the collisions that we've seen at the energy water nexus have occurred back east. But there's one very important collision or potential collision that we're realizing here in the western United States. And that has to do with the hydroelectric generation on Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam blocks up the Colorado River and creates Lake Mead. At its fullest, Lake Mead has an elevation of 1,220 feet. We've seen the bathtub ring. Imagine if it was full. That's the highest elevation. When that level drops below 1050, Hoover Dam almost has to completely shut down. That's the level at which there's too many bubbles coming into Hoover Dam and we can't generate electricity anymore. Right now, we're, at a we're almost at a critical elevation. Today, we're at 1,085 feet elevation on, in Lake Mead. At that elevation, 1220 minus 1085, for every foot decline, we're losing 5.7 megawatts of potential generation on Hoover Dam. Right now, Hoover Dam is operating at about 60% of the total capacity for which it was actually originally licensed. That's very important when we're thinking about energy, water, drought, as well as implications of climate change here in the western United States. Okay, so let's transition now and let's think about the energy or power that's required for our water systems. Average across the United States, the best estimates are that between 10 and maybe 13 percent of our entire electricity supply goes to powering our water systems. That's pumping our water up from groundwater, it's treating wastewater, it's making sure that we have fresh water delivered to our homes. It also includes heating the water that we use in our homes. But in the Western United States, we use a disproportionate amount of our electricity for our water systems. In fact, in many states across the Western United States, over 20% of the electricity that we use goes to power the water sector. So the map that you're seeing on your screen right now what it's showing are the relative trade-offs between locally occurring natural supplies and local demand. In places where you see shades of yellow, orange, and red, these are not places that are necessarily running out of water. These are places that rely on reservoirs, reservoir storage, conveyance, or overpumping of groundwater, or on wastewater treatment in order to ensure that there are adequate freshwater supplies. So if you live in the western U.S., what this picture tells you is that you are really relying on pumping and conveyance and large-scale infrastructure to ensure that there is adequate water. But all those processes that I just named, they have take an incredible amount of electricity. For example, the Central Arizona Project pumps water from Lake Havasu up to Phoenix and then on to Tucson. Three things you need to know about that system. It costs over $3 billion to construct it travels over 300 miles, up 3,000 foot of elevation. And every year, it uses on average 3 million megawatt hours of electricity. That's a tremendous amount of electricity. The Central, 
Central Arizona Project, or CAP, is the single largest user of electricity in the state of Arizona. And what powers CAP? It's a coal-fired generating station that sits on Lake Powell in Page, Arizona. That power plant, over 40% of the electricity that it generates goes to power the Central Arizona Project. And so if you live in the state of Arizona and you get your water from CAP and you're worried about your carbon footprint, you might want to be considering where your water is actually coming from. But CAP is not the only large-scale project across the western United States. There are several. There are some that pump water, for example, up over the Tehachapi Pass and down into Southern California. That project requires a lot of energy. For those, for example, living in Northern California, it probably takes about 1.3 megawatt hours of electricity per acre foot of water that you use in your house. One megawatt hour, that's how much a family will, a little bit more than a family might use in a year. So hopefully that, that kind of gives you an idea of what those, those numbers are. So again, Northern California, 1.3. Southern California, because of transporting the water over to Hatchby Pass, over four megawatt hours of electricity per acre foot delivered is required. Compare that with some of our friends back east. In New York City, your water supply takes less than a megawatt hour to provide one acre foot of water. So depending on where you live, anywhere in the United States, there's going to be a very different amount of electricity embedded in your water supply. So if you care about carbon, and if you're thinking about your electricity use, then you really need to be looking at where you get your water. But this isn't just an important issue now. We also have to think about the future. Right now, there are many additional infrastructures being considered across, in particular, the Western United States in order for us to be able to deal with future drought events as well as the potential for climate change. And some of these systems have tremendous electricity demands. This is very, very important that we think about what's happening with respect to our water systems and what the implications are for, for energy demands. And to circle back in this energy water nexus, if we're powering our water systems with thermoelectric generation, we're using water for that thermoelectric generation. Now granted, we do have other options. There are hybrid technologies and dry cooling options that are being employed across the West. Because we know in the West, we are innovators. We really want to think about how we're doing, about what we're doing. But we really are looking at a very different future and how we deal with our water supplies and ensure that we all do have safe drinking water, we do have fresh water available, we can support agriculture and ranching. We need to really be careful. We need to think more holistically. We can't just be thinking about water, we can't just be thinking about energy, we can't just think about carbon or land use. We need to tie those all together. So I hope that you found this really interesting. Energy Water Nexus, not something everybody thinks about. But hopefully, we was able to drive something home that you'll, you'll consider in the future. Thanks.